Hello everyone, I'm Seth Grebner at Washington University where I teach French and cultural studies, but today I'm in Olin Library Special Collections where we are looking at some of our treasures from the vault. And today we have a really wonderful thing here. We have one of those monumental multi-volume things that I just love to pull out. They look wonderful, they really are neat. And since I don't know everything about it, I'm going to ask my colleague, Tilly Bouncouillet, who's a French professor, to tell us more about it. So this is Diderot's 18th century encyclopedia of all the knowledge that there ever was and everything you would ever need to know about anything, right? Just about, yes. This um, encyclopedia project uh, was originally given to the co-editors Diderot and D'Alembert, it was meant to be a translation of a two-volume English edition encyclopedia, and the project just burgeoned from that original vision. It turned out to be 17 volumes of text and 11 volumes of plates published over two decades uh, involving uh, about 134 contributors and upwards of 74,000 articles. So roughly speaking, it got 15 times bigger. Just about, yes. Yeah, and uh, it has become a fascinating study for the history of the book because it was subject to the censorship laws at the time, and they had to do a little bit of uh, strategizing in order to get the entire mm -hmm. thing published and in the hands of the literate. Well, one of the neat things about it, of course, is a lot of these books is the, the, the title page. The title page looks beautiful, but it also comes with a frontispiece that is a very famous thing. Our version doesn't have it, and that's because frontispieces, especially if they're very ornate, sometimes got taken out and got used for other things. So it's not entirely surprising that our copy doesn't have it. Yes, yeah, so this frontispiece sort of emblematizes uh, the pursuit of knowledge in the 18th century. Uh, and at the top, at the peak of this um, sort of pyramid of muses, you have truth. Uh, who is veiled, and removing her veil uh, to the right of truth. You have both reason and philosophy. At the feet of truth, you have religion, uh, who has her back turned towards truth and is looking directly upwards for divine inspiration. But you can also see that reason uh, looks tempted to put a bit in the mouth of religion. On the right-hand side, uh, along with truth and philosophy, you have history and the sciences. And to the left, underneath imagination, who is about to crown truth with a uh, crown of, of flowers, you have the arts. So here you have um, basically all the branches of knowledge that are going to contribute to this collection that is the encyclopedia. Well, it's a very impressive thing, and it's, it's no wonder that people wanted occasionally to take it and use this picture for something else. <laughs> Absolutely. So you mentioned divisions of knowledge, and yes. that's, of course, one of the problems for any uh, encyclopedic venture. And the 18th century philosophes had this problem, and so they came up with their own division, and I will just unfold it here very carefully. Our, our version has a small tear here, unfortunately, but it's still pretty solid. So here is the figural system of human knowledge. Exactly, and this was inspired by Bacon's system of knowledge uh, in the 17th century, uh, and what you have here is a tripartite division of knowledge divided into memory, reason, and imagination. And once again, you have the various uh, subjects or branches of knowledge uh, underneath these various categories. So underneath memory, we find both history and natural history. Under reason, we find both philosophy and metaphysics. And under imagination, once again, we find literature and the fine arts. So natural history is, of course, the 18th century for science what we call uh, natural that's sciences. That's right, the precursor of right. the natural sciences. Right. But also uh, the notion of nature as a history or even as a book. We thought of the book of nature uh, at the time or the spectacle of nature uh, sure. in purely descriptive terms. Mm -hmm. Part of the irrigation of observation and experience over uh, reasoning in one's ivory tower. 
Mm -hmm. And I see science of God or knowledge of God comes right at the top of reason. Right That's right. Middle. That's right. Sometimes uh, knowledge of God was thought to be um, obtained via the pursuit of science or philosophy uh -huh. or the arts. So these subjects were the means of either arriving at or ultimately casting into question the existence or the necessity of God. You know, there are people who say some things about Wikipedia, that any Wikipedia article is only so many clicks away from mm -hmm. every other Wikipedia article. And there are jokes about, you know, how many times do you have to click to get from anything to you know, whatever your favorite ridiculous Wikipedia article is. But this makes me think of that here, this like, how far up the tree do you have to get before you can branch down to another part of this tree of knowledge? It's, it's an amazing diagram. That's right. And it sort of, it represents, um, one of the many ways that a reader can find a point of entry into the larger assembly of volumes, uh, often um, following the keywords in individual definitions mm -hmm. or possibly this branching tree. Now, one of the weird things about this encyclopedia is something you just told me, that they, they weren't really that interested in objectivity. Yes. So... Uh, in order to understand uh, how to go about uh, entering into uh, this encyclopedia, we sort of have to take a step back and think about how we use encyclopedias today. If you go to the Encyclopedia Britannica, for instance, you might uh, consult a definition in order to get at this truth, which is being unveiled in the frontispiece, get at truth. Uh, you might not even think to look at the author of the definition. Right. Well, no, probably not. Uh, in fact, it, in fact, it's probably just initials at the bottom. Right. You, you so, have to look somewhere else to so find the author So relatively anonymous, and uh, the um, genre of the encyclopedia entry uh, is objective truth, right? Mm -hmm. In here, there is absolutely no pretense either to objectivity or to anonymity. It is uh, really uh, the embodiment of an enormous social debate. The Enlightenment has been characterized as the century of debate. Uh, and this can be uh, perceived as a, a debate or, or a dialogue or conversation or consultation. In order to demonstrate the wit of the greater enterprise, uh, we have uh, the definition of encyclopedia inside the encyclopedia. Oh, yeah, right down there. <laughs> and this one oh, is actually... And it actually... says it's feminine. Yes, that's it right. is feminine. And it says that it's from philosophy. That, that's, that's very useful. That's right. Uh, and it is actually authored by the editor of the encyclopedia, Diderot. Uh, and in it, he represents the term as a chain of knowledge, an enchaînement des connaissances, uh, in sort of figuring the uh, collected volumes as a vast network uh, in which you're basically meant to let your fingers do the walking. Um, if you follow the definitions through the volumes, you realize that the, the, the book actually over, uh, it spills over its own uh, boundaries. Even uh, the fact that it, it, it expanded from the original projected two volumes to, to 28 was not enough in order to sort of contain uh, the, the um, immensity and the visceral nature of Knowledge the social debate. Knowledge always gets bigger. Yes, There's exactly. Always more. So uh, an example would be um, the definition of harmony, for instance. You have two entries under harmony, mm -hmm. uh, one by Diderot, in which he is um, representing uh, natural harmony. And sure. he, once again, like the definition of the encyclopedia, he um, characterizes it as a relationship between parts. So right. there, again, you feel like you have a microcosmic view of how the encyclopedia might work. In Rousseau's definition of harmony... Because that's the other one. That's going to be about music. He's defining musical harmony, yes. Uh, but the interesting history behind the definitions of music in the encyclopedia is that Diderot originally offered them to Jean-Philippe Rameau, the extremely prolific opera composer of the time, Who's a lot more famous and for, as a composer than Rousseau, and for a good reason. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, but uh, the, the origin of the enmity between the two is that Rameau refused the commission, Rousseau accepted it, and then Rameau took issue with Rousseau's definitions of music and decided he should write uh, a, a, a rebuttal oh, okay. in the form of errors and the definitions of music in the encyclopedia, mm -hmm. and the debate went on from there. Uh, similar uh, story uh, grew up around 
Rousseau's taking issue with D'Alembert, the other editor of the encyclopedia's mm -hmm. definition of Geneva. Unfortunately, Geneva was Rousseau's hometown. Uh, so he thought he, he, had knew a certain a he knew a thing or two about Absolutely. Geneva. Absolutely. And he took issue with uh, D'Alembert's uh, recommendation that what Geneva really needed was a theater. And that gave rise to Rousseau's extremely famous oh. uh, letter to D'Alembert on theater or spectacles, uh, which led to D'Alembert's ultimately withdrawing from the Encyclopedia Project. So these debates kind of uh, uh, burgeoned past once again, the limits of, of the encyclopedias Absolutely. themselves and became the uh, subject of debates in the press, in the salons, in other um, sort of um, models of what would ultimately one be day be the republic. So we have here one of the 10, you said, 11 volumes, 11 volumes, 11 of, volumes of these things called planches. Uh, a planche is a, uh, is a plank, literally, but it mm -hmm. means in printer's uh, jargon, it means a plate. And um, here we have a very nice big Fold illustration, out. fold out uh -huh. illustration. Uh -huh. That's right. What are we looking at here? These are some of my very favorite plates, which once again illustrate uh, both the arts and the trades. Uh, this is really uh, a gold mine, not only for um, those interested in literature, philosophy, and the sciences, but also those interested in, in art history um, and the history of uh, technology. Uh, here we have uh, something that originates really with um, almost an, an oxymoron. There is a term in French, merveilleux, the marvelous, uh, that came to signify not only the intervention of the gods in everyday life, but the machinery that made that possible on the operatic stage. You also have oh. a converse evolution of okay. a related term, machine, which came to refer not only to the machinery that made these entrances and exits of gods and demons possible, but to the gods and demons themselves. Yeah. You're referring to that expression, deus ex machina. Deus ex machina. God the arrives in a machine. That make it possible for the gods to rise or descend. So here on stage. what we have on stage, here what we have are some of the uh, cogs and wheels and pulleys that you find backstage at the opera and which the scientists of the time uh, considered that we also find backstage in nature or in the human body or behind uh, this semblance of reality, which I see. Uh, is the beginning of knowledge. All right, well, thank you very much for this look at what I think is an amazing monument. Um, but I'm very glad we have one here at the library. Thank you very much for talking about this with me. This was a pleasure. It's rare that my students get a glimpse of the original. Uh, since this is available online, it would be nice to invite them in uh, to get a look and fingers on these pages. Well, I know you've done that occasionally, uh -huh. and I would just like to point out again that all of the items in Special Collections are in fact available for people to come and see.